At the end of my last film, I said that I'd soon be talking about what I think is causing long COVID. Well, it made sense to cover this rather hot new topic at the same time, and that is microplotting. What is it? Why is it happening? What symptoms happen as a result? And how can we stop it? Well, I've spoken to my good friend, Dr. Assad Khan, who's out in Germany at the moment undergoing help apheresis to learn more about it. Stay tuned and let's dive in. For quite some time now, we've been looking at four possible causes for long COVID, and they are viral persistence, viral debris, overactive immune system, and autoimmunity. And it looks and has felt like there's a sort of a subset of further sort of conditions, if you like, that may be triggered by one or more of those. And they include mast cell activation, uh, metabolic dysfunction, dysautonomia, and yes, sticky blood, also known as microclotting. Each of these subset of conditions having a range of symptoms of their own. And it may be that we're not just looking at one of viral debris, viral persistence, overactive immune response, or autoimmunity, but some combination of one, two, three, or four of those. And equally, <laughs> whatever combination of those is going on, we may also have a combination of mast cell activation, metabolic dysfunction, dysautonomia, and so on. The question is really, how does all of this interact? What is it that ties it together? And what order do each of these conditions come in? What is top of the tree setting off the cascade of other problems? And that is really the sort of the $64 million question that we're trying to crack. The real challenge here, though, is that it may prove to not just be one of these, and all long haulers have a medley um, of each of these going on. Imagine a top trumps game where we've got a high score in one category, let's say dysautonomia, um, does not necessarily preclude you from also having a high score in mast cell activation or microclotting or indeed metabolic dysfunction. And the person next to you may have a completely different array of conditions leading to a different array of symptoms. It really is an incredibly complex uh, cross-system multifactorial problem. And this is why Western medicine has struggled so much to try and get a handle on it, because knowledge is siloed. The thing is, as we've continued to gain more and more knowledge over time, there's too much for any one brain to store all of the, sort of what we understand now in medicine, uh, basically to squeeze it into one person's head. So we have to create these silos so that we get specialists who can actually learn as much as we know in any one given discipline. The problem is that what long COVID seems to need is a helicopter view and also to go deep at the same time. And this is the challenge when it comes to trying to work out what's going on with a condition as complex as this. One of the other consequences of this smorgasbord of conditions and array of consequential symptoms is that what works for some people won't necessarily work for another. And I give you an example here of uh, someone who's fairly well known to the community who started increasing their exercise level at around six months and helped them make a complete recovery. This won't work for everybody and indeed could be really harmful uh, if, <laughs> if you're someone who suffers from post-exertional malaise. This is kind of the state of play as we understand it at the moment. But recent research, including papers from Pretorius et al. and Ryu et al., suggest microclots might actually be at the core of the problem, for some or most long haulers at least. How exactly? Well, let's chat to Dr. Khan, who's very much on top of the latest science. Good to see you, Assad. You are looking well. well. Um, and let's start off with sort of the, the principles upon which all of this is built. Um, so could you talk us through what the uh, proposed mechanism is of, uh, of illness for long COVID that help apheresis is setting out to address? Sure, um, I'll try. I've come up with uh, a bit of a patchwork of it, uh, looking at different papers that have come out uh, from South Africa and from San Francisco. So what is postulated to be happening is this that the S1 portion of the viral spike protein acts as a very strong antigenic stimulus. And that causes what we call a polyclonal B cell response. So B cells are uh, the cells that produce antibodies. So what you get is an indiscriminate, indiscriminate shower of antibodies provoked by the viral S1 protein. 
Some of these antibodies are autoantibodies. So they will attack different parts of the body. Uh, so they may attack the joints, the heart, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but one of the primary targets seems to be the endothelium, which is the inner lining of your blood vessels. Now, when that endothelium becomes inflamed, uh, that acts as uh, a further stimulus for more antibody production as well. Um, so what you're getting is lots and lots of uh, clot, i.e. fibrin. Uh, you, you get uh, platelets which are activated, um, in fact, hyperactivated. Um, and uh, as a result of these clots and this thickened endothelium, um, where these layers of fibrin are being deposited, uh, that results in reduction of the flow of oxygen and nutrients from the blood to the surrounding tissues. And that explains the symptoms of long COVID because the symptoms, as you know, they're multiple, they're nonspecific, they seem to affect every organ. Um, but a microvascular explanation, which is what this is, does sort of tie it all together really well. Um, and the presence of microclots has been demonstrated conclusively by Professor Rizia Pretorius uh, of Stellenbosch University in South Africa. She demonstrated that the uh, exposure of plasma to the spike protein causes the production of microclots that are resistant to lysis by heparin. So because this fibrin is responsible for the symptoms, but also because it acts as a stimulus for further antibody production, you're caught in this vicious cycle that until you remove this fibrin, you're not gonna get out of. So I think this microclot theory is, is really a line worth pursuing. Um, and it may very well lead us to uh, some answers. How health apheresis works, because these microclots are so hard, you actually need to manually remove them. And that's what the procedure does. So uh, if you imagine a dialysis machine and uh, you've got blood flowing out of one arm into this machine, the machine then separates out the red blood cells from the plasma. The plasma is then run over an acidic filter, which then absorbs the fibrinous material, which is a clot material. And then the cleaned plasma is recombined with the red cells and returned to a vein in the other arm. Um, so essentially what we're looking at here is a, and this is why it's so difficult and people haven't necessarily worked this out yet because this isn't necessarily an easy thing to look for or to find. And the way it manifests is also sort of tricky to pin down as well, right? Because you've got tissue hypoxia um, in any possible organ anywhere in the body, anywhere that's yes. served by blood, yes. any organ, any tissue, you name it, including the brain, can be starved of oxygen periodically. And this can explain some of the waxing and waning of long COVID symptoms, because sometimes when you're feeling all right, you've probably got <laughs> oxygen to the right places. Um, and the other thing as well that's, I think, important about this as well is the downstream effects of cascade of other problems that this sets off. So whether we're talking about uh, mass cell activation or whether we're talking about metabolic dysfunction, um, is it fair to say that um, this sort of uh, aberrant clotting in the blood yeah, yeah. is responsible for creating that cascade that creates uh, a whole bunch more symptoms than just the microclots themselves? Oh, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, uh, for example, if you look at your gut, if you have an ischemic gut, uh, it's going to become porous. And then toxins and antigens and antibodies uh, from your gut will get absorbed into the blood. Uh, so that may be one of the mechanisms by which um, you, you get these muscle type symptoms. Um, also, um, if you look at POTS, for example, so um, it may be that there are antibodies uh, against the nerves, but it may also be that the small fibers of the nerves are becoming ischemic and, and that's what's giving rise to the POTS. Uh, and because the worsening of all of your symptoms goes together, it seems to make sense to me 
that this tissue hypoxia ischemia is, is the driver here. One of the things that this sort of theory helps me sort of get my head around as well as explain post-exertional malaise as well um, and why activity uh, can cause problems. And it seems to me that with the metabolic dysfunction that we've got, where because the, um, the cells are basically starting to operate anaerobically rather than aerobically, it's very inefficient. They're not creating enough ATP. So we don't physically have enough ATP to run the processes in our body. So this creates another set of symptoms. And if we spend that ATP, I mean, it is literally our energy battery, right? If we spend yeah. that ATP, then we're basically left in this debt where we can't service the basic functioning of our body because we've just spent it by what by whatever it is, depending on how critical our ATP levels are, whether it's walking down the road, going for a run or just going up the stairs. And what that means is that some period later, you, that deficit will hit and the piper will come to be paid. And <laughs> you basically have to suffer until the body has generated slowly and badly because it's not functioning correctly enough ATP to run the you know, physiological processes again. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, think, I think that explains PEM, or as we meant to call it now, post-exertional neuroimmune exhaustion or post-exertional symptom exacerbation, uh, whichever that uh, acronym you choose. Uh, yeah, I mean, people have been looking for an explanation for PEM for ages and, you know, various things have been thought about, such as movement makes the virus circulate, et cetera, et cetera. But it's, 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 it's hypoxia, it's ischemia, it's anaerobic metabolism, it's lactic acid generation. Um, and uh, as you know, anaerobic, anaerobic metabolism is very inefficient. Um, so um, it doesn't take very long for you to use up that ATP. So you've got to rest. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your personal experience. So you went on BBC News um, and spoke a little bit about what you've been doing there. So could you just yeah. fill us in on your experience um, to date? But obviously you could spend an hour talking about it. Yeah, but... sure. In a nutshell, I've had my insight into treatment so far. And uh, there are definitely some improvements. Uh, I would not say I am cured, um, uh, but uh, definitely... For me, it's been a positive experience. I um, certainly am able to problem solve better. My energy levels are better. I'm not needing the long afternoon naps that I used to have. Uh, my POTS is better, although still very much there. So I, you recall, Jez, I've become hypertensive and I couldn't tolerate my dream. And uh, I think that's because of uh, uh, laying down the fibrin in the blood vessels, making the wall stiff. And uh, now that that's been removed, I actually ended up being hypotensive with low blood pressure. But now the system's recalibrated, so I've got normal blood pressure. And you know, that, that is quite remarkable. Um, I still crash, um, and uh, some of my symptoms do still come back. So my urticaria came back in a really bad way um, a few days ago, and I had to go on steroids. But I think what's happening is that um, uh, with the disruption of the microplots, uh, lots of inflammatory molecules that are trapped inside are being released. So it's quite common that people describe in between cycles getting a bit worse. Um, and I have experienced that. Um, what I've also realized is that everybody's different. So there are some people who will feel a difference after one procedure. Uh, some people may not notice anything as tangible. Uh, there are some people who have six or seven and then uh, they've gained maximal benefit and then they stop. There are others who have um, had to come back. And there are some like myself where, um, particularly it seems to be the dysautonomic people. Um, they do seem to require quite a few procedures. Um, so for what works for me is, um, procedures spaced one week apart with plenty of rest in between. Uh, and I think I probably need another three or four, but we will see. Um, and uh, I mean, the things we've talked about, you know, good diet, pacing, um, rest, uh, they still apply. Uh, this is not some kind of uh, genie and bottle magic cure. Uh, it, it's a good treatment, it make, makes sense, but the treatment is holistic. And I think our viewers do need to sort of to remember that. I, certainly from my perspective, um, you seem very different now than you did a few weeks ago before you went to Germany. I have noticed a big change in the speed of your thought, the speed of your speech, uh, mm -hmm. the clarity of your operation. Um, it does. It feels like someone's basically just, you know, I don't know, flicked a switch somewhere that is just suddenly enabling executives 
active function to percent as opposed to you know 70 percent or whatever you'd percentage you'd put on it i'm not going to insult you by saying you were at, uh, you know I, well but... if i if i was to be honest with you i was probably 10 percent of myself uh, uh, on a good day i mean you know what it was like for me you know yeah. uh, you, you followed my journey so closely as i have followed yours yeah uh, so yeah bed bound not eating just kind of giving up on life i made it to germany and yes um, it's been it's been it's been worthwhile um, so let's talk a little bit about um, about those microclots again. Do, is this something that we think um, is driving all long COVID, and um, or are, is you know is it just half of the people with long COVID have got this going on? And does it also apply to ME and CFS as well? Is it a mechanism that makes sense there? Um, yeah, good question, and it's a question that a lot of people have asked me. the The honest answer is we don't know, uh, but Certainly, for those patients where they seem to have uh, prolonged, persistent symptoms affecting different body parts for months and months, and they're not getting better, and we know that a lot of patients aren't getting better, in fact, most aren't, as per your recent video, um, this is likely to be the mechanism. And when we talk about this distinction between MECFS and long COVID, I've now arrived at a point where I like to think in terms of the different things that viruses can cause. Okay, so SARS-CoV-1, for example, um, gave a lot of people ME. And there is no reason why SARS-CoV-2 would not do that. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 may also give people um, a direct myocarditis and not give them ME. In the same way, if you look at the common viruses that cause uh, what we call ME or ME-CFS, like Epstein-Barr virus uh, or enterovirus, no, they don't cause ME, which is defined as the presence of post-exertional malaise for three months, six months, depending on which definition you choose. Um, some people will get that, others won't, others will have a mild illness. So I think I'm realizing now it's more useful to define ME uh, and different presentations in terms of the syndrome rather than the particular virus that's causing it because different viruses all cause multiple presentations. Um, so it would follow then that with there being this overlap uh, uh, between, shall we say, long COVID and other viral forms of ME, where people are getting uh, these multiple symptoms that go on and on and they're getting PEM, the microclots, it's quite plausible that they're at the root of this. And uh, speaking to Professor Pretorius, um, that she feels it's, uh, um, it's probable quite strongly. And uh, she's got an MECFS project uh, uh, ready to go after she finishes um, the one that she's actually coming to Germany for in a couple of weeks. Uh, so I think, honestly, I don't want to count my chickens before they hatch, but we're at a very interesting crossroads here. Uh, and we should have a lot of information um, out there before too long that will hopefully guide some therapeutic choices for people. So are there any markers that indicate whether people have got these uh, microclots? Is there any way they can be tested for them? Um, and, and for people who do have the microclots and respond to apheresis, why are there tests for standard clotting factors like D-dimers coming back normal? Okay, yeah. Uh, good question. Again, something that people, that people have asked me a lot. Um, so are there any markers? Uh, no, actually. Apart from detecting the microclots themselves in a lab like Professor Pretorius did, um, uh, it, there, there isn't a blood test that you can run on, on say, you know, your, your whole blood or your, or your plasma uh, put through a machine that's going to tell you, ah, microclot positive. That doesn't exist yet. However, uh, uh, Professor Pretorius and uh, Dr. Anna Brooks in Auckland are working on this. And uh, um, I think, um, you know, the coming weeks may, may give us some information uh, because that would be brilliant. Um, because if we have that, then you can kind of, sort of predict who um, will benefit from apheresis or not, potentially. Uh, why are the blood tests normal? Um, so actually, if you look at my case, where my fibrinogen levels and my D-dimer were normal, I think it's because what people have forgotten is that D-dimer is a result of fibrin breakdown. 
So you've got two processes going on. You've got uh, the clotting pathway going on, where your blood is trying to clot. And then uh, you've got uh, a balance, which is your fibrinolysis pathway going on, okay? Uh, so that, um, you know, your blood is neither too thick, neither too thin. And what happens, or what appears to happen in long COVID is that there is an imbalance in favor of the clotting side. The clotting side of the pathway is comprised of a platelet hyperactivation, something called the intrinsic pathway and something called the extrinsic. Let's leave it at that. Um, and because that is predominant in my case and also in a lot of other patients' cases, they're not breaking down their clots because they've got elevated levels of a substance called antiplasmin. And plasmin breaks down clots. Because they've got this antiplasmin stopping the plasmin from breaking down the clots uh, and the fibrin isn't being cleaved, you don't get D-dimer. Um, and you could argue actually that if, um, if you have a normal D-dimer, you're probably very clotty. Uh, I mean, you know, I've been already been called Captain Clots and you've seen the pictures of my clots that came out. Uh, so yeah, I, I mean, this is again really interesting, isn't it? Where, um, as, as I've been saying from the beginning and as you've been saying, uh, just because tests are normal doesn't mean that you're not sick. You can be very sick. You can be more sick if you have normal tests. So I don't want people to think that because their D-dimer is negative, they may not have clots or the fact that their D-dimer is several thousand means that they're full of microclots. It's not that simple. Yeah. Um, so moving on, and you're probably well placed to answer this as well, being a respiratory consultant, but can you talk a little bit about venous oxygen saturations um, and their relevance to um, long COVID um, and what those results might mean um, and where can people potentially have this tested? Sure. Um, so I'll answer the, se the second bit first because that's easier. Um, so it's not a test a GP can do. The way it's done, it's a, it's a simple uh, venous blood sample taken from your peripheral blood. You take the sample in a blood gas syringe and uh, without delay, put it into a blood gas analyzer. Now these machines are found in hospitals, in the emergency departments, in ICU, uh, respiratory wards, etc. What do they actually mean? So first of all, I want to clarify, uh, this is a non-specific marker um, of uh, the transport of oxygen between the, um, uh, the blood and the tissues. It doesn't mean that you've got microclots. It doesn't mean that you've got long COVID. It doesn't mean that you've got any. Um, you can have a normal value and you can still have these conditions. And again, if you have a very abnormal value, it doesn't necessarily mean that you do have these conditions or that you have microclots. What it represents really is um, the balance between two processes. One is the um, ease with which oxygen diffuses from the blood into the tissues. Now, if you've got lots of clot and clot material, then it's going to be difficult for the oxygen to enter the tissues. So by the time uh, the blood has passed through your organs and returned to your venous system, it, it will have a high venous oxygen saturation uh, because the oxygen has not been transported into the tissues because of all the barriers. But there is another process. We know that the tissues are damaged. They're uh, performing anaero anaerobic metabolism. They're full of lactic acid. So they're actually at the same time hungry for oxygen and trying to extract this oxygen from the blood, um, which will lower the venous oxygen saturation. Now, this is where it gets complex. You've got both these processes going on in long haulers, potentially in people with ME as well. Uh, so it's just a reflection of imbalance between the two. In my case, uh, I was shocked to see that mine was 32. Um, which shows that my tissues um, clearly so uh, starved of oxygen that they're just extracting whatever they can from the blood, despite the fibrin barrier and the microclot. Uh, that, that suggests how ill we actually are. 
Um, but again, I, I want to reassure people that um, you know, not having an abnormal venous oxygen saturation doesn't mean that uh, you know, you're not sick or you don't have these conditions. But it, it's a good kind of non-specific indicator uh, of, of, of being um, unwell uh, and there being issues with oxygen transport. Um, and just to clarify as well, this isn't the same as um, a pulse oximeter that you might have on your finger where you'd expect your O2 sats to be 96% plus if you're well. This is the venous and the, I think you said before, the median normal um, uh, saturation would be about 73%. Is that right? Yeah, yeah there is a range. Um, so the median for an adult male is 73 um, and uh, uh, ranges... Um, there's multiple, but uh, generally speaking, between 65 and 75, some people say between 60 and 80. Uh, so yeah, I mean, mine was low. Can you tell me where help apheresis is available? Um, and if people uh, are interested in trying it or inquiring about it, um, <clears throat> what are their options? So, so first thing to say is I'm, I'm here as a patient. Uh, I'm receiving the treatment. I am not involved with the clinic or with the provision of the treatment. Uh, uh, the information I have is that there are several clinics in Germany um, that can provide this treatment. It used to be used for lipid removal, uh, but increasingly it's being used for long COVID. There um, are centers opening up in uh, Zurich, um, and I believe uh, that uh, it's being provided in uh, Turkey and Russia as well. Uh, there is a help apparatus machine in Cardiff as well. Uh, there may be two, I'm not, not uh, exactly sure, but they're not providing treatment for long COVID at the moment. Um, uh, and, and the dis distinction between help apheresis and other forms of apheresis is important because um, other forms of apheresis are not going to remove the clots. So your standard plasma apheresis or dialysis machine is, is, is not going to have the same effect. Um, if people are interested, what they can do is um, they can click on the link uh, in the description um, where it says Afrit Association and, uh, and then register their interest. And um, there is a waiting list. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of long haulers out there. And recently, the waiting list has um, exploded, for which uh, I'm partly responsible. Uh, but never mind. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, um, there, you can sign up for it. And um, if um, you have long COVID uh, or, you know, if you have MECFS or even if you're vaccine injured and you have similar symptoms, you can register your interest. Uh, but yeah, again, just to clarify, I don't have anything to do with the clinic list or prioritization of the running of the clinics. I'm here as a patient. Uh, and I'm also trying to do a bit of data gathering, which we can talk about later. What are we seeing in terms of proportion of long COVID patients who improve, um, how many treatments does it normally take and what's the range there? At the beginning, a patient were receiving four or five treatments perhaps, whereas now it's being realized that actually uh, the clots are requiring more cycles and increasingly you find people having eight or more. And whilst there haven't been any objective measures so far uh, to demonstrate um, you know, what percent improvement there has been. Um, speaking to people, and I've been here a month and a half now, so I've met quite a few long haulers. Um, the general feedback is that they are improving. Uh, there are people who were uh, like me, who were bed bound, uh, had severe POTS, and they are now more or less functioning normally. There are people who had very dysautonomic breathing, um, and they notice a difference after one procedure. Um, there are people with ME. I mean, one lady springs to mind. Uh, she had been bedbound for seven, seven years, and uh, um, she she can now walk. And I witnessed this myself. So th there's definitely improvements here, um, but you know there is a range, and and there are some people who have, shall we say, more modest. Um, results after the standard sort of six or eight cycles and, and are needing more. Um, uh, but I think, um, you know, the picture will become clearer once we've got some objective um, outcomes. Uh, uh, and uh, hopefully that will enable clinicians in other areas to make informed decisions uh, about provision of, of anticoagulation apparatus. 
So can you tell me um, a little bit about what research is uh, happening in Germany or about to happen in Germany or what, what have we got that might just um, crystallize what's going on here in a form that sort of makes other places take notice? <laughs> Sure. Um, so uh, most importantly, Professor Pretorius is uh, going to come to Mulheim. Um, and she's coming on the 15th of November. She's going to spend a week here and she's going to be running a battery of tests on the blood of aphoresis patients, uh, both uh, pre and post. So demonstrating what is it that aphoresis is actually removing. Uh, and that should give us a clue as to why people are feeling better. And if there's stuff left over, then that may represent a target for other treatments. Uh, some of the bloods are going to be sent to Auckland um, to, for different analyses. So there's lots of people working together on this uh, uh, to try and really sort of hone this. Um, but also this represents a really good opportunity for uh, gathering some um, simpler sort of clinical outcomes. And uh, uh, whilst I am sick and having the treatment, uh, uh, I think uh, it's a really good opportunity to measure simple stuff like the effect on breathing or the effect on, on walking um, or, um, for example, uh, your um, cognition. So I've been, uh, been gathering some resources and uh, we're, we're going to have a uh, pulmonary function machine. We're going to have a transcranial Doppler um, and we're also... Uh, going to um, hopefully have um, the ability to do MR scans of patients before and after aphoresis, looking for lactic acid in their muscles, and also PET CT scans, looking for platelet uh, hyperactivity in the brain and in the chest. So um, it's a big ask, um, uh, and it's, we're all kind of pulling this together as we speak, and we've got uh, you know less than two weeks. Uh, to 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 actually get this off the ground, but sometimes the best ideas are written on the back of a poetry stamp. Um, and I guess being here um, uh, has really really helped me um, sort of uh, realize the importance of producing those objective outcome measures. Um, and and uh, I feel privileged to to be playing a part in this. Um, so I think if we can show that uh, even after one cycle of apheresis people are noticing an improvement in cognition uh, or they're walking better um, or their orthostatic tolerance is better, then I guess that acts as a good signal for clinicians to go, hey, I mean, there's something about this anticoagulation apheresis that seems to be benefiting people. How about we just try anticoagulation and see what happens? Um, and obviously one cycle isn't enough. Uh, you do need several uh, for the final results. So the hope is that we can keep collecting data from, from these patients and, uh, and, and then do some before and after complete data sets and, and, and look at uh, what, what the final improvements are. Um, it's very difficult to um, blind people uh, in this kind of study because you'd have to subject them to a sham aphoresis, which although you could say is a gold standard to have a control arm like that, I don't think I'd want to undergo eight cycles of needles stuck in my arms for no reason. Um, so it's the best we can do at this moment in time. Um, and it's challenging because we're all sick as well and, and volunteers, but we've got some help coming from America and hopefully we can pull this off. So given that the waiting list for the aphoresis is huge, uh, um... It's not available in the UK. <laughs> um, what is it? What's useful? What conversations can long haulers usefully have with their clinicians um, that might help them going forward? Um, okay, so I mean, the first thing to say is that, that all of the stuff that we've been talking about uh, from the beginning, you know, the pacing, uh, the breath work, uh, the attention to gut health, uh, that remains important. Certainly talking to long haulers who've had apheresis, the ones that seem to have had um, the maximum benefit, and, and this is anecdote, are the ones who have been very strict with their diet and with the pacing and with the resting and with the control of dysautonomia. So those things still apply. And uh, the patients can still practice those things. Um, but I do think we are at a point where it is reasonable for clinicians to discuss trials of anticoagulation with their patients. I mean, I remember as a junior doctor 21 years ago, 
uh, when we didn't have same day CTPA scanning or Doppler scanning for clots, we used to send people home on anticoagulation, on clinical suspicion, uh, explaining the risks and benefits, and then we bring them back for investigation and then either continue the anticoagulation or stop it. Uh, the one thing I would say is that patients must not self-medicate with anticoagulants. That is an absolute no-no. Uh, these are potent drugs. There are multiple drug interactions with other commonly used medication, uh, which can enhance uh, the bleeding risk. And also, if you have underlying conditions such as liver disease or kidney disease, or if you are frail and elderly, or if you're prone to falls, uh, then anticoagulants um, can be quite risky. Um, so it's, it's something where you really, really do need an experienced clinician weighing up the risks and benefits with you. Uh, before you get put on them. But I do think that um, where appropriate and where the risk-benefit ratio is, uh, is not adverse, uh, it is reasonable to give it a go, uh, I would say for four weeks, uh, because people are suffering and there is no other treatment out there that seems to be making a difference to the underlying condition. Um, and this ain't going to get better on its own. Um, what patients must not do is accept harmful treatments that are making their symptoms worse, such as rehabilitation or way of exercise. Uh, and patients should now feel empowered to decline that. Th there's some other really good resources for clinicians um, where you can look at how to manage the different syndromes of long COVID, like POTS and like MCAS. Uh, and, you know, thinking about myocarditis and thinking about things like uh, COVID toes, et cetera, uh, and, uh, and cognition and cerebrovascular disease. Uh, so in America, you've got the um, CDC guideline on long COVID. And in the UK, I think the best guideline, which is um, a consensus statement, uh, comes from uh, the Delphi group, uh, headed by Professor Brendan Delaney uh, uh, at Imperial. Um, I was one of the 33 doctors that contributed to the guideline. Uh, it's very simple, straightforward. Feel free to take a copy to your GP. Uh, we're going to put the link in, in the notes anyway. Um, that actually gives some concrete information about, right, what test do you do? How do you do an active stand test? What antihistamines? What doses, et cetera? Um, what other things should be looking for? Um, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, the greatest lesson of, all, lesson of all pacing and energy management. So I think our videos are excellent, uh, but also the World Physio uh, Statement um, position paper um, and the resources from Long COVID OT and from uh, Long COVID Physio. I mean, it's, it's a tough journey. We, we, we've done this ourselves. Um, uh, and I think for some time we are going to be driving this and nobody else is going to have the same motivation that we have. Uh, but I do think that we are at the cutting edge of, of, of some new therapies now. And um, hopefully, hopefully, if not all patients with long COVID and ME-CFS, we should be um, developing some treatments that will help a lot of people um, and, and, and they'll see improvements, if not cure. Great stuff. And finally, if people have any further questions, what should they do? Okay, so first of all, thanks everyone for the response to the BBC interview. Um, I'm really touched and, you know, I, I do consider myself very privileged that I'm able to afford this treatment and be here and able to advocate for our communities on the media. Uh, I feel really lucky and, 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 you know, all the compliments have been really, really humbling, but uh, I am still quite sick and I can't respond to um, direct messages or messenger messages or WhatsApp messages anymore. So I think what we'll do, Jez, is um, if, it, uh, if it's okay with people, they could just put questions in the YouTube comments. And then when we've got a whole bunch of new questions, we just come back and do another video and try and answer those. Um, that would be more efficient because uh, I mean, I need to recover, you need to recover. And also I need to be ready for that research that's happening in, in two, two weeks time. That, that's what's gonna make the difference. So I'm not being rude, apologies if I don't respond to your messages, I just simply can't. So put them in the chat. Great, thank you very much. Thanks, Jez. 
So, what do I think is causing long COVID? Well, honestly, the reason why I think siloed Western medicine has found the condition so difficult to pin down is because there is no singular answer. It does seem, however, that this microclots avenue is very promising. So the hope has to be that with some more evidence, we get clinicians around the world taking it seriously and looking for treatments and therapeutics that might just make a difference. With the right evidence and trials, we might even see help apheresis being picked up by the NHS. But don't hold your breath. Unless you're doing box breathing, of course, in which case, crack on. Because the rest of everything that we've spoken about on this channel, from pacing to diet, breath work and stress management, all remain absolutely key to staying as well as we can. Hope you found this film interesting. Until next time.